So straight into it, why the fifth metatarsal? Why this long slender bone on the outside of the foot? I mean, there's so many bones in the foot that we could speak of, but this one with football being on the on the lateral side of the foot and being so long and slim is just in an area where um, certain football movements um, can kind of put it in the line of fire for, for loading or, or for forces that come through the foot. Um, and it can be quite tricky to manage. So uh, we want to go through today is, is the different sort of zones or the different areas that may be injured. And, and Dr. Peter will cover um, how you classify those um, and what some of the treatment options may be and how they might differ. It's also uh, an injury that can can be reasonably severe in terms of the number of, the number of days out. Um, you can see, you know, a player here is out for three months um, and it can cause uh, players to get um, into a little bit of a loop sometimes with issues like uh, non-union or refracture. So it is taken reasonably seriously when, when something happens. Um, and we have a, a player here that got quite distressed and really for his birthday wish just wanted a new, a new metatarsal. So it can be troublesome. Um, to plot that out, what that might look like, um, this is a, a figure I adapted for uh, from a PhD uh, thesis. Um, and what we have here along the horizontal axis, we have the incidence, so the number of injuries per 1,000 hours, and this is in Champions League football. And along the vertical axis, we have the severity or the number of days lost. So what we plotted out here is injuries that happen quite frequently, like a hamstring injury, but it might not put the player out for too many days. So let's say 20 odd days. And then we have injuries that happen infrequently, like we're all aware the ACL injury, um, putting them out for six to nine months at times. And this is where the fifth metatarsal fracture sits. So somewhere in the region of, uh, you know, 80 days or so, um, and with a refracture rate that can be an issue. But this was back in 2013, um, prompting uh, Xtran and Van Dyke to, to call this a possibly career ending injury. Um, we'll hear sort of some updated research that Dr. Peter's done himself on that as we go forward here. So it doesn't happen all that often, but when it does happen, it can be a bit of an issue. So today we want to do a little bit of an anatomy refresher, um, talk about these different zones and, and how that might make the treatment plans differ, um, identify the different fractures and, and if you like bone stress injuries that can happen. Um, think about ways that we might be able to modify some factors to minimize the risk of re-injury um, and have a little chat at the end and answer any of your questions. So just to get, uh, just to refresh, this is where the fifth metatarsal is. We have this, the base here or the styloid process. We have the cuboid here and a fourth metatarsal that butts up against it. So it's on the lateral side of the foot um, and the, the injuries can tend to happen around around the base or even a little bit more distal. Everything always looks so lovely and clean on x-ray though, and remembering that we don't just have bone in this area. Um, we have some pretty large attachments. So this is the, looking at the, from the plantar aspect at the um, plantar fascia. So, you know, really large, dense structure that's made to store and release energy. Um, it has a component that attaches on the lateral side. Um, we also have some attachments, uh, muscular and soft tissue attachments. So we have peroneus brevis coming into the base, um, peroneus longus just tucks underneath on the cuboid. We have peroneus tertius or um, your extensor digitorum longus. And this can be reasonably variable in different people as well. So we have to remember that there's all these attachments and also a little intrinsic muscle, abductor digitio minimi pedis that's attaching here. So they are all internal kind of they will generate internal forces um, on the bone, so that will cause some some bending moments to the bone, some some torsion, some twisting, and that will tend to pull on the base of the metatarsal or from each of those attach attachments. We also remember the ground reaction force that comes through um, that the the muscles and things are actually reacting to that will cause an external force. So we have these external forces from uh, the ground and from the athlete pushing on the surface and then these internal uh, forces that go through the bone. And if we watch the stance leg here for Messi when he's whipping the ball in, we can see how he flicks over way over on the lateral side of his foot. Um, and this is a reasonably common movement for very talented set piece uh, football players. They seem to really 
um, really whip the ball in and sweep over on their stance leg. So we just quickly watch again on the land, leg that's planted on the ground. He'll flick right over onto the outside now. So we can we can get a picture of some of the forces that must go through as he pushes through the ground to impart those forces onto the ball. So I want you to think a little bit about some of those while Dr. Peter runs us through um, some of the uh, some of the identification of each zone and also some of the, the ways to possibly surgically um, uh, treat those. Thanks, Atul, and uh, salam alaikum, ahlan bekom. Nice to team up all together in, the, in our one team approach and Thanks for the chance to join and uh, present to you the surgeon's perspective in regard of these um, type of fractures. And we will focus on the basis of the metatarsal five fractures. Now, as a small introduction, I um, remember that we were all uh, a few years ago looking into these type of injuries because we were asked to really tailor to the needs of our elite athletes in specific cases. And we looked at the literature and the literature, especially from the football research group, showed that it happens, especially in young players, mainly pre-season, and prodromal signs can have an influence. Um, although they were rare, they are very impactful, as you have seen already. And our mission started where, uh, when Michael Owen, the striker from the national team in England and Liverpool, um, came in the clinic and, and discussed his third metatarsal base fracture, um, allowing him not to perform on one World Cup stage, two European Cup stages and many qualifiers. So it is rare, but it can be very impactful, as Athol showed in the career ending fashion of a, of a player. And, and in that one team approach, we all have our passion for our sports, all our passion for our departmental disciplines, and uh, we've all seen that the technology, the innovation and the, the research on the topic has helped us. But in the end, the return to play was still and is still uh, a really troublesome um, area. So we believe that we need to make a difference by joining as our one team approach. And the impactful research from podiatry together with uh, surgery, hopefully in the future can alter that and can can not only help in a solid recovery, but also um, helps us in our mission to uh, promise what we owe to our players, which is to bring our work together and to hope by doing so to eliminate that that long recovery time that we, uh, we are all suffering with. Anyway, back to the basis of metatarsal 5. We're going to talk uh, the next 10 minutes about the background, the treatment indications, the return to play and the augmentation that are currently out there. And why don't we start with the basis? What's out there? Um, the fifth metatarsal fracture, you can basically divide them, as Assel showed, in uh, three zones. We have the most common zone, which is the one, the tuberosity avulsion. We have the uh, less common but uh, annoying, as we can call, Jones fracture, which is the proximal metadiaphysial area. And then we have the diaphysial fractures, where most of the time the real stress fractures occur. Of course, there's more uh, distal ones as well, but we will tackle uh, for the, the specific reasons of the talk today only these three. So the avulsion fractures, the most frequent ones, well, you've seen in the video from uh, Messi that uh, Atul showed, and also from the anatomy and the, the functional anatomy, that there's a lot of pulling and 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 impactful forces in that area. So what's happening? Well, because of the mismatch there, you can have avulsions and we call them the acute ones and we don't really worry about them because they heal well with conservative treatment. And in case of severe displacement, we just fix them back or remove a fragment and put the peroneus brevis back. So that's where we are with the tuberosity avulsions. But then we come into the so-called Jones fractures, the zone two, the more rare ones. And Fair is fair, we have to uh, showcase all the data. And um, although I'm biased as a surgeon, we do know that in the non-athletic population, they kind of heal well through proper conservative treatment. And we know that it's a watershed area and it's especially time that we need to make it heal. And that's where we come into trouble with our athletic population. So that's where surgery comes in, not to 
improve on the union rate because they are quite similar between surgical or non-surgical approaches, but especially on the differences in time to return to sports. And we'll elaborate in a few minutes on that. Now, what do we do? We can put screws, but they, these are still static fixations. So we still need immobilization and um, some, uh, some classic uh, fracture treatment help with that. Although you will see that thanks to the work of Atal and his team, uh, we were able, even in the static uh, fixation, to improve on return to play as well, thanks to the pressure uh, plate testing and insights that their impactful research has, has helped us with. Uh, we can also do cerclage, and that's an interesting one because although the screw is static, the cerclage is a dynamic compression fixation, meaning it really helps and teases the cells there locally to heal faster. The problem is the low resistance of this, this construct to repetitive cyclic loads. And then, of course, when you really have communicated fractures and uh, you need to reduce them, we can use uh, plate and screws. But you all know that the athletes don't really like that because it gives a lot of symptomatic hardware. In summary, what we've done, we've tried to combine the static with the um, uh, dynamic fixation by combining them. And since now, uh, we started in our cadaver lab this, uh, this new idea. And nowadays, we fix it both in order to have a solid union, but also a faster return to play. And then we come to the stress fractures, the zone three, where um, actually the first paper I uh, once read about it was from the 70s from our beloved Professor Popovich, who already identified this annoying issue in the athlete. So uh, 50 years later, here we are discussing uh, still the ongoing uh, troubles we have with that. So we have a, a long road to go. Um, also here, we can use the classic fixations, but um, we believe that combining the static with the, with the dynamic fixation is the way to go, and we've seen that in our data. So how can we help in uh, return to play? As I said, since 50 years we're discussing this, but we believe that with the combination of impactful research now, we can make a difference. And we actually uh, looked with our team in uh, last year on a, the largest meta-analysis out there on these fractures in athletes. And they included uh, plus 600 athletes, 22 studies, and 96% of them, of these athletes, were able to return to play. Um, in the surgically management, it was almost 100%. In the non-surgically management, one-third uh, falls out of the boat. So just for you to know a little bit on the data, uh, 20 studies out of the 22 reported a 100% return to play when they surgically managed. And you have good results in uh, soccer, football, basketball, and uh, sports where they occurred the most. So acute fractures, stress fractures, and refractures had similar return to play rates. So we do know how to bring the athlete back. The real issue is the time to return to play. And that's where surgery is currently in our data a bit superior. Um, because we can have our athletes in a mean return to play around nine weeks and 13 weeks in non-operatively managed. So, um, interestingly, elite athletes had a notably shorter time to return to play in percentage. So, what's going on with our athlete towards return to play? Well, it is associated with refractures and elite athletes, they tend to uh, become more asymptomatic sooner due to their high pain tolerance and the fact that they just want to play and not to annoy uh, the coach and the, the physical coaches uh, with their issues. So uh, we really want to stress that in your elite athlete, although the pain can resolve fast, you need a CT scan confirmation before return to play um, is allowed for the simple reason that these are the, the type of cohort people that can have refractures and ongoing issues with uh, recurrences. So the stakes are very high and we need to do risk assessment and a shared decision making with our player. A last word on the orthobiologics. Uh, interestingly enough, um, orthobiologics has been used for many issues in, uh, in football, but one of the primary ones in surgery is the fifth metatarsal fracture because it's a watershed area, because it heals difficultly, because you need a return to play that is solid, um, timing-wise and bone-wise. And what does it uh, tell us? What's out there? Well, we checked it with our team again, 
and we looked into a systematic review of 718 fractures in Atlas. And we saw that 72% uh, um, of the fractures went fixation without augmentation and in 28% with, which is quite high if you consider that overall in a sports surgery. So we found a trend towards higher fracture union rates, but similar return to play rates and time to return to play, meaning that uh, orthobiologics may have a role, but it's still not very clear. So what do we do? We add bone grafts so that we have all the uh, possibility and the environment for the fractures to heal. We add bone marrow aspirate concentrate, and we can have many other uh, adjunctive uh, um, kind of types of support where stimulating uh, features like uh, shockwave and other uh, injection therapies can help. In summary, it's much more than just a fracture fixation. You need to check the vitamin D status. You need to check the nutritional status. And in female uh, fractures, you can uh, have an impact by the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, cycles that are typically for the female. Obviously, intrinsically, the cavovirus and the metatarsus adductus need to be considered as well alignment-wise uh, if you want to consider additional procedures in order to uh, avoid refractures. And we need to educate our athletes that prodromal signs are out there and are important and are flags for us to make sure it doesn't evolve to a disaster situation. Uh, the refractures are the most common in the first year. Um, the stimulation through shockwave is suggested and is further uh, being under in investigation. And, and the last word from a surgical point of view, you can do a good fracture fixation, but more often than a known, you can have an impingement on the cuboid that uh, requests further hardware removal, which is not what the athlete wants. So put it in well, but make sure that you don't have uh, additional features around the cuboid that is impinging or frictioning because you can have a good fixation, but if there's remaining pain, you didn't really help with the athlete. Now, um, a further note will be on the stress fractures, and I'm happy to go uh, to give the word back to uh, Dr. Afo. Thanks, Peter. That's um, that's a really good, concise um, overview of what can be a complex topic. So thanks for making that um, that nice and brief for us. Um, I want to concentrate a little bit more on the on the bone stress injuries um, or the injuries that are on a bony stress continuum, if you like, um, or indeed even how we might manage some of the other injuries as you're coming back to return to play. You're you're getting back to that on field rehab type scenario. How how might we um, minimize the chances of, of suffering injury in this area again. Um, the screws are very strong, but we have seen some bend and we have seen some fracture, and so there's huge high forces going through this area. Um, so as Dr. Peter mentioned, about with regard to the bone stress uh, injury or the stress fracture, which is on this kind of blue zone or a little bit more distal along the this long slender bone here, tends to be in young male players um, who have an increase in training load so that kind of common, you know, leaving school age at the academy, doing very well, maybe dragged up to the first team. So suddenly everybody wants them playing lots of matches, big change in load. Um, more common in the midfield position, which sort of might put down to just the fact that they ping a lot of passes around and a lot of high velocity passes and balls where they're standing on one leg, you know, um, hitting the ball. So that scenario we looked at with Messi at the start. Um, stance leg most, most often, so the non-dominant limb, um, and there is some stuff out of Japan talking about artificial turf use and um, the theory there is that the, the loading is a little bit different. It seems in male players, for some reason, you, you load the foot a little bit more laterally um, on the artificial turf than you do on natural grass. But a huge thing, as Dr. Peter mentioned, is this prodromal symptoms, which are really early warning signs. So players that complain of this vague lateral foot pain in the lead up to the actual uh, event, if you like, um, it is very common in our research. All of our players, uh, every one of them had them. And I think in earlier uh, work that Dr. Popovich did in 2005 and Dr. Peter's done, they found uh, also that players have these prodromal symptoms. So that's uh, possibly an area where we can get in and actually uh, if and do something about that if there's good communication channels to, to, to pick up and listen to the player about that. Obviously, there's been a very big uh, change in technology from boots that were extremely 
protective and and uh, stiff. I'm not sure if you have video coming in still, but um, we've had boots that became very, very flexible, um, almost split sole designs, which were super light with thin uppers, uh, thin materials, so that was improved feel for the ball and feel for the for the surface, if you like. Um, so there's a real difference in how lightweight boots have become uh, that offer a little less protection. There's also been changes in the playing surface. You know, studs have been able to penetrate into these softer surfaces um, that would become waterlogged. And now we have this incredible technology where stadiums can have um, vacuum systems underneath them. And the, the playing surface is predominantly made from sand, which can get a little compacted. And players will often talk about it feeling hard or that the studs aren't penetrating the surface so well. So I'm here to chat about what we can modify. So, you know, what are these factors could we possibly um, could we talk to the groundsman about changing the training pitch if the players are complaining? Um, could we have a communication loop there? And could we also look at changes to football boots and possibly even changes to the type of exercises we're doing early on uh, in the rehab? So back to our, uh, our figure here, um, remembering that the ground reaction force um, usually when you're say you're running straight line, you know, you'll strike on the outside or the lateral side of your foot and then roll inwards, um, so to speak. So a lot of force going through the lateral side here that this um, screw has to put up with and the fixation has to put up with. And remembering that it's just not all on one plane. It's it's obviously we move in three dimensions. We, we can have um, these large bending moments because it's such a long, thin bone. If it contacts the ground first, then we get these large bending moments that put a lot of pressure at the base, but there can also be rotation, um, torsion, compression, all sorts of things. So I guess starting with how you even how you even look at some of these forces, a lot of studies went down the route of looking at someone just stand on a on a um, pressure plate or something or look at a static alignment to see do you have cavus feet or not, do your feet tilt, tilt outwards. And, the, and there's a little bit of evidence there, but not a lot for, for static. So we wanted to have a look at um, some dynamic movements on the football pitch as, as players got back to um, doing their on-field rehabilitation. So we managed to get a, a cohort of, they actually were all international football players, as it turned out, um, who had been to Aspatar, had imaging surgery, rehab um, uh, with us, and we were able to follow up on. And we also uh, were able to have as best possible some match controls that would come along with them so they would bring a bring a buddy in a similar position so that was um that was uh, fabulous to be able to be able to do that but what we wanted to do was look in and look at some of the loading that happens between the foot and and the boot um and and subsequently the ground so we had some groundsmen make sure the pitches we were using were uh kept in a in you know for the same hardness and the same sort of surface properties over the course of the the um, examinations or the assessments we had an old insole system which we put insoles into the boots they carried around a little backpack um, and this data logger sent information to the laptop and i would chase them around with this laptop so <laughs> this has moved on to wireless insoles now that we have and it's a lot easier but um, you have to do what you have to do at the time we put everyone in the same football boots just a firm ground um, football boot that had molded studs um, and then we looked at certain movements. So first of all, we looked at a, a set piece kick where the player would have to lean over on that foot as Messi did in the, in the video and whip the ball into the corner, trying to hit the top post. We also looked at some running with ball into play so that they would run up to this cone, pass the ball to a player and then the player would pass it back and they'd have to run a tight curve around the circle and we would measure the curve running here. So they would curve in towards the injured side and then they would do some others where they'd curve away from the injured side. So um, to have both of those. And we had some straight line running where they would get up to a set speed. It was around 20 kilometers per hour. Um, and then we would record as they ran through. And what we did is look at the pressure at each of those movements. So just to get you um, uh, orientated here, the purple is the highest pressure. Each of these little pressure sen sensors would pick up. And for the curve kick, as you would imagine, they lean right over on the lateral side of their foot. So we have high pressure, um, very high pressure through that lateral margin of the foot. With the curved run, as they curved in towards the fifth metatarsal, again, we had very high pressure there as you're, as you're edging or curving in. And there's a lot of curved runs in, in football. Um, and then eventually they would push off their big toe. But with the straight line running, we had very little pressure at all. At, at the lateral side and much more through the first metatarsophalangeal joint. So um, 
we also found, we won't go into today, but the, the, the people who had had a fifth metatarsal fracture were ex put extremely high forces through the lateral sides of their foot. Technically, they seemed better at whipping the ball in. They, they put more force generation through here. Some of them were up to sort of 3,000 newtons plus through the outside of their foot, so very high loads. Um, and the same with the curves. They just were superior in getting into those curved run positions. Um, and then it was fairly similar for the straight run. So we can think about certain movements as they first return to the field. Um, perhaps we would uh, just have a certain amount of loading cycles for the set piece kicks without having them do, you know, multiple sessions. If they really like doing that, you might have to just keep an eye on the, the magnitude or the force they're doing them at or even just how many they're doing. Um, and curving away from the injured metatarsal seems okay. So bones need load and stimulus to, to get them to unite, you know, to remodel. But um, maybe we just keep an eye on uh, the force again or the speed at which they accelerate into those curves or curving away to begin with is a little easier. And straight line running, uh, even at a reasonable um, pace, 20 kilometers an hour, seemed to be okay. So we could get some load through there without stressing the area too much. Um, yeah, definitely looking at this, I think we need to, we'll talk about some modifications that can happen to the boot so that we can possibly protect that area a little bit. So from that, we we thought curved running and kicks rather than just sort of straight or static analysis, really to have a high index of suspicion if you have a young midfield player that's reporting vague lateral foot pain on the non-dominant leg. So on their stance leg, their vague pain, if they're reporting that and you have monitoring in place, that might be a time to intervene. Um, and yeah and really trying to look at some specific training especially at the onset of prodromal symptoms so can they stay involved but just have a little bit more prescriptive training for a little while rather than a, a dead stop so what can we do we can look at some of the areas that are uh, that are modifiable and one of the few things a, a player has in their own hands is the boots they put on their feet um, and can we adjust any of these elements that go into making a modern football boot that might help out um, and remembering that all of these studs or cleats or blades, um, they do sit underneath, you know, anatomical kind of bony areas. So if we have a very large stud right underneath the base of our fifth metatarsal, then it's effectively going to make a very long lever to be able to cause a bending moment of the fifth metatarsal. Um, also important to look at how much uh, length there is between these two, because again, we're going to make a very long lever. So we'll get to that. Um, studs need to penetrate all the way to the stud plate. So if they don't, we end up with areas of pressure right over the studs. And pressure is just force over a given area. So we really want the pressure to be spread out over an area rather than in one point. So chatting to our ground staff and knowing how the training venue is, getting information. This was El Saad's training pitch, getting information on how hard the pitch is on how much um, traction there is, how much moisture is in the surface and a little feedback loop where the players can say that's starting to feel a bit hard and then the ground staff can can modify that by renovating the surface. So really we want, you know, lots of shorter studs at the start when they're first getting back to playing. I think we want to avoid, you know, very long studs and, and few of them. We want lots of smaller studs. Um, so we'll get to that. Um, otherwise, we're ending up with areas of high pressure that can sit right under the area that we don't really want them. So kind of pushing them towards an artificial grass outsole, which is these small studs and lots of them, the boot is exactly the same. You can still have your preferred, whether it's the elite version of kangaroo leather, exactly the same boot that you have, but with small round studs and lots of them, rather than longer studs or, or having a, a very large blade, again, right underneath your fifth metatarsal. Um, I think that's particularly important for those first sessions back on pitch for the first little while where there's not nothing riding on it. That's not a game scenario. There's not uh, a trophy riding on it. It's just getting some loading through the foot again. Now, I've seen scenarios where um, where we had a, a huge distance between, between the um, studs at the forefoot and the studs at the heel. And what teams were doing were putting in an extra stud here, and that was to decrease that huge long lever arm that would end up bending. So you find if we can push them towards boots that have a little shorter lever arm. Now, if they're at the very high end of the game, um, and Dr. Peter and I have been lucky or unlucky enough to have to manage with some of these difficult situations, you can ask athlete services at some of the bigger brands to modify their boots. If not, then it's a matter of 
getting on some of the websites like um there's heaps of them where you can order boots with this modified uh outsole so artificial grass outsole if you like um where the boot bends is the real concern there was a stage where we we're having a lot of split sole designs where we would see a hard part at the forefoot a hard part at the heel and then nothing in between and I'm really pleased to say that that seems to be dying out. We've worked really hard with a lot of the major brands and given a lot of feedback from players about that. Um, that was an issue. We were having to constantly stiffen up boots. And this was one modification that we worked with with Athlete Services to, to stiffen up. The fifth metatarsal would still just hang over the end and the first metatarsal would be here. So we would still have, you know, bending where we wanted it but we would decrease some of this excess um, motion through the through the fifth metatarsal area. Um, and so that was really important to try and get bending back where we wanted it at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So the eagle eye people will spot that um, Iniesta here has had a, a stud added to his boot um, just as and had the outsole actually changed just because of having this issue. Um, some brands have worked on prototypes where they had only lateral support. So this is the medial side of the boot. They would run studs along the lateral side only, and these have now ended up in production. It's really important to remember that um, that we're variable, and this is uh, my colleague Ken Van Elsenoy in podiatry certainly hopes that this team hangs around, uh, and Peter as well, for quite a while after the group stages here in Doha. But this is a Belgian football team and some really simple, simple uh ink plots of their feet but you can see you just no you know it's it's you can't really just have a favorite boot and say everyone must wear this after a fifth metatarsal fracture it just doesn't work like that so kind of subject specific prescription on knowing your boots or knowing a friendly podiatrist um you have ken we have farhad and we have lubna up in podiatry that do this stuff every day and do a fabulous job so reach out and use them um the width of, of the, the boot, so how wide it is and how wide your, that should mirror the shape of your foot. So if we end up having a foot overhanging or spilling out over the over the sole plate, that can be a bit of an issue. Um, obviously, especially if you're working over onto that side of the foot for some of those spectacular kicks, um, there'll be no plate between you and the ground. And so there'll pretty much be no protection. And what we get is the upper of the shoe spilling out over onto the ground and then we have basically um, metatarsal and maybe the tiniest thinnest bit of synthetic uh, material uh, and that's it but it's not as simple as saying well adidas uh, are narrow and nike or puma are wide because uh, what i've done here is i've simply photocopied some insoles out of boots and these were two Pumas, they were both called Evo, uh, but one was Evo Speed and one was Evo Power, and you can see this really different kind of profile to the to the boot shape. So getting to know your boots is fairly important, and that can really help when players are at that age where they're only coming into contracts and things. You'll, you'll kind of change their lives if you can push them towards boots that mirror getting into contracts or uh, relationships with um, brands that mirror their own foot shape instead of squeezing the, their feet into um into boots that don't fit them for years and years we've seen uh, people try to modify for some protection and put plates on the outside of boots or even in american football there's some papers on putting what they call a clamshell device which is like a polypropylene kind of shell that comes up along the outside to protect the fifth metatarsal i'm yet to find anyone that will wear it so we we don't uh, do that in elite sport um it's probably important to mention that while it's a bony stress continuum players may have prodromal symptoms there sometimes seems to be a, a kind of end inciting event as well like so here we have some artificial surface next to a grass pitch there's different friction properties and ovary steps and and it goes into an inversion injury but it's interesting when getting the the history taking to find out that actually they had vague lateral foot pain for weeks months leading up to this kind of event not in this particular player but you, you know what i mean so important to um remove any of these little obstacles you know if his training pitch is built like this it's important to engage the groundsmen or federations to make changes and we've done that here worked hard with the local committees and the, and aspire sports turf and, and been very vocal about not having that um that uh, artificial pitch right close because of that problem so here, I'm pleased to say um, this is, I think, Al Janoub Stadium in Wakara. 
and all of them will have five metres from the sideline, you know, because players can effectively run down and back into the pitch without that change in surface or any slopes or any changes there that they're not expecting. Uh, and they'll also have a few metres at the training venues, not five, but at least a couple. In terms of the insoles that go into the shoes, that's done up in podiatry. And um, we uh, this is just a bit more clinical kind of reasoning rather than hard, cold, hard facts with trial and error. But we tend to try and um, try and find what fits for that athlete or that player in terms of comfort. Um, so that how how firm the material is. Some people like really hard material, others like softer. But also we try to make them dual density. So the back will be a little bit firmer. Now this is the left foot. Um, there'll be a little bit more support. So a lot of fill where the fifth metatarsal is, but we want the head still of the, the top of that fifth metatarsal to be able to come down into this softer material. So we would kind of almost put put them on the opposite um, to what someone would normally get, we would extend the support laterally instead of extending it into the medial arch. And that's really to try and make sure again that we get a lot of forces going through this first toe, um, first metatarsophalangeal joint. I mean, it's, it's big for a reason. It's meant, to, it's meant to store and release most of the energy. There is some evidence for uh, strengthening. So foot strengthening, this is a Japanese study where they dragged a little dynamometer, a little rig. There's some evidence for both kind of horizontal foot drags and also vertical. Um, and in in this study in particular, uh, they did this um, at the start of the season, checked everyone's kind of intrinsic muscle foot strength, and then found the, the, the fifth metatarsal fractures tended to be in the lower foot strength. So I guess it makes sense that those muscles can come in and bear some of the load that the bone is having to, to go through. So if there's good uh, strength and endurance there, that might be something to look at. Just reiterating, it's super important to try and learn about those warning signs or symptoms. Um, uh, I love this. I put it up every time. You know, the difference between a good and indifferent clinician is the time spent on history taking. And that was, you know, written in The Lancet in 1933. So things have not changed. I think listening to how the, the player feels on the outside of their foot listening to how they feel in the boots that they're in. Um, if you've ever played golf, apparently there's a sweet spot. I've never found it on the golf club, but that's apparently called the sweet spot and it feels really good. And I've certainly heard that with players as they run around on the pitch and we make changes to their boots, to their insoles, to their movements, that they find a sweet spot that works for them. I think it's important to um, be honest with the player that this is a little bit of trial and error and we can work on harder insoles, softer insoles, different movement. Um, to embrace that a little bit and be honest about it, we don't all have to have all the answers right away. I think it's, um, you do yourself a disservice if we, if we pretend that we know everything from the start. We cover most of these things in a, in a piece that I've done with some great colleagues um, in this just fantastic edition of the Aspatar Journal. Um, it covers, you know, football boots fitting for, for women, for, for adolescents and, and some of these issues. So it's open access and please go and have a read. Um, so conclusions, I think if we can look at some load modification at prodromal signs, if that is possible, that takes a, a very honest and good communication system at a, at a club where someone is happy to flag up that they're, that they, not happy, but they feel comfortable to flag up that they have foot pain. Um, that's a difficult one if you're a young player and let's talk about that player at Man City. He's probably not going to tell Pep Guardiola that he has lateral foot pain because he doesn't want to you know, miss a game. So it's a difficult one. Um, as they're coming back to the on-field sports-specific type training, looking at just you know, small round studs and lots of them, especially if it's non-skilled based, if it's running based or just getting some load through the bone. Um, I think that's a good idea. After the screw fixation, there's a study by Miller and colleagues that says, uh, you know, you can get back to return to play. And these are Premier League players, English Premier League, um, between eight and 12 weeks. So even before the radiological union. And the theory is probably that, again, that bones need some sort of load um, to remodel. But um, there is some evidence emerging that you know, that they can get back a little sooner, um, probably more work needed there. The shoe width, as we discussed, should be subject specific. It should mirror your foot. And a really easy way to do that is to take the insole out of the shoe and stand on top of it. If the player is spilling over this edges of it, then it's obviously too small, which happens in football all the time. Players could be a size nine, but we're a size seven. So it's a little bit of um, education there. 
the toe flexor strength makes sense and you can we can talk uh, offline about ways that might be good to um to work into the to the protocol and then just avoiding that large distance between the studs on the heel and the studs on the forefoot 